Okay. Good. All right. Good afternoon to the parents who have joined us here today. Thank you for spending a part of your Saturday evening with us. So welcome to... It looks like I'm bringing a storm in. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so welcome to day one, uh, panel two of our PCA Parenting Conference 2023. I'm Diana Elizabeth, Senior Curriculum Specialist from PCF, Professional and Education Development Division. I'll be your moderator and host for this evening, this late afternoon's presentation. So this um, afternoon, we have three professional speakers to share tips and strategies on exploring literacy with young children. Uh, first, I'd like to invite our first speaker for topic one, fostering executive functions for literacy in children, Dr. Aisha Abdul Rahman. She's a research scientist with Office of Education Research, NIE and NTU. So, Dr. Aisha, I'll leave it to you to do your introduction. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Diana. So, as Diana mentioned, uh, my name is Aisha. I am a research scientist at uh, NIE. Uh, and my research is on executive functions, which I'll be talking about uh, today. And um, uh, mainly I'm interested in understanding what influences executive functions and how we can um, foster these uh, skills in, uh, in children and uh, teenagers. Right? It's great. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aisha. So next, we have our speaker for topic two, which is bilingualism in early childhood, Dr. Mary. So, Dr. Mary, over to you for your introduction. Uh, hello. Yeah. Um, good evening. Uh, good to see all of you here. So, I'm Mary Leju. So, I'm a psychologist by training. So, I work uh, for KKH for their uh, community project to include more children with developmental needs into the mainstream schools. Yeah. So, besides that, I'm also a part-time lecturer uh, in NUS uh, under this um, Master Program for uh, Speech and Language Pathology. Uh, so today I will be sharing more about uh, bilingualism in uh, early childhood. So that is also my main interest of uh, research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. And I heard that you are well versed in English, Malay and Mandarin. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> okay, so um, our third speaker for topic three, which is building literacy at home. And here we have our very own educational therapist from PCF, Ms. Tio Yosa. Ms. Tio, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Yusa here. So I'm an educational therapist in PCF. So what I usually do is uh, I teach children with mild developmental needs uh, who have learning difficulties, uh, memory retentions under the Development Support and Learning Support Program. Thank you, Yusa. Okay, so before I hand over the stage to our first speaker, Dr. Aisha, I would urge parents as we um, as you listen to what the speakers have to share, please do take down your questions that you have for them because very interesting topics going on today across um, executive function, literacy and bilingualism. So I'm pretty certain that you may have questions of your own. So Dr. Aisha, for your presentation, please. Okay. Um, uh, um, so in the panel session today, I'll be talking about executive function skills and uh, how or why it's important for literacy skills in children. So here's a quick uh, overview of my talk. First, I'll be talking about what executive functions are, what are some of the uh, mental processes that we refer to when we, when we say executive functions. And then I'll give a, a quick highlight or overview of how executive functions develop. And then uh, I'll look at why EFs or how EFs are associated with literacy skills in children. And finally, I'll end off by uh, telling how caregivers can help develop executive function skills in the children uh, and what are some activities that you can get them involved in. Right. So first, let me start off with what executive functions are. Uh, executive function, it, it's actually a very broad and rather technical term uh, that refers to several mental processes. Uh, that allow us to think and act in a manner that helps us to achieve our goals, right? So um, when you say executive functions, you can think of it something like a chief executive officer uh, who has a task or who has a job to get done. 
So he uh, gets people to work uh, in a way that achieves that, uh, that goal or gets the task done. So executive functions, similar to that, uh, it uh, organizes our thoughts and actions to achieve our goal, right? So it's goal-directed. The key word here is that it's goal-directed, meaning that you should know what your goal is and then act towards achieving it. And uh, this is often the opposite of behaving in an automatic way or a habitual way uh, where you don't have to think too much, right? So just to give a concrete example so everyone knows what, uh, what I'm talking about, uh, think about when you have to take the bus or the train or if you're driving, right? And if this is a route that you take often, right, like going home from work, you don't really have to think or focus too much and you can still get off at the right place. But if it's a route that you have not taken before, if it's your first time taking, then you have to really focus uh, on the landmarks so that you can get off at the right place. So this is the kind of um, activities where executive functions uh, help with, uh, where our automatic or habitual behaviors are not, not enough. So executive functions require effort, they're effortful, right? So, um, what are some executive function processes? Researchers have identified three basic processes and they are working memory, inhibition, and shifting. All right? Working memory refers to the ability to hold information in mind and update that information as you receive new information and uh, manipulate or move the information around in mind. Right? An example of this if, would be if someone tells you their phone number uh, but you don't have a pen or your phone with you. So you have to hold it in mind until you get to somewhere where you can write it down, right? This requires working memory. Uh, with children, they need working memory uh, when they are, you know, when they're, when they're in a class and the teacher is teaching. They need to remember what the teacher is saying at the moment and then put it together what, we, what, if we, what she said just a minute ago to make sense of what she's saying, all right? Next, inhibition. Inhibition refers to the ability to suppress uh, irrelevant or um, uh, thoughts or actions. And uh, this is sometimes also referred to as uh, impulse control or, or self-control, right? Uh, inhibition is required under many uh, scenarios. Um, you know, for example, if you are trying to eat healthily and you go home and you find a box of chocolates, right? So can you stop at one or, or you know, or uh, instead of taking more because you know that that's not in line with your goal? And uh, for this, you need inhibition, right? Or think about children playing with toys, right? Two children playing with toys. Um, are they able to wait for their turn to play with the toy without snatching it away from the other child, right? For this, they need inhibition, right? And the, and the third factor is uh, known as shifting or, and is also known as cognitive flexibility. And uh, this refers to the ability to, to shift between different tasks and different goals. Right? And an example of this would be shifting between different languages. Um, in Singapore, most of us speak in uh, you know, more than one language. Right? So cognitive flexibility helps us to identify which language to speak at when. Right? So if you are at home and you speak with your parents in one language, uh, or if you go to a shop, you need to speak in another language. Right? So cognitive flexibility allows you to shift between um, these different languages, right? So these three skills, uh, you know, they're often talked about as separately, but in most real life situations, they work together. So for example, if you're listening to me uh, speak, uh, you need to remember what I'm saying, right? To make sense of what I'm saying, but you also need to filter out any other distractions that's going on around you. So this is an example of working memory and inhibition working together, right? Okay, so, um, this is a graph that shows how executive functions develop. Let me see if this pointer works out. Okay. And I want to draw your attention to this, um, this important point here between the ages of three to five. Right? And this is the preschool period. And if you notice, you, you, you can see that the, the line here is very steep. Right? And that shows that executive function skills are actually developing very rapidly during this uh, time window. Right? And it, you can see that it's steeper than at any other time point in life. And then uh, later on at uh, adolescence or during the teenage years, you can see that it continues to grow further. Right? So what this graph really shows us is that the period between three to five years of age, right, it's a really good time to focus on developing the executive function skills in, in children. Right? 
And um, in the next graph, this is just a picture of the brain, right? This is a picture of the brain, how the brain develops or reaches maturity from ages 5 to 20. So 5, 10, 15, 20, right? And um, the green regions in the brain shows that the brain regions are not well developed or not mature. And the blue and purple regions show that the brain regions are well developed. And you can see that when the children are young at age, age 5, there's a lot of green, right? And then as they grow older, there's a lot of blue and purple. Right? And I want you to focus on this front region of the brain, which is known as the prefrontal cortex. Right? The prefrontal region plays a key role in executive function uh, capabilities. And you can see that it doesn't quite develop well until early adulthood. And this uh, supports the previous slide where we saw, right? Where you see that um, you know, executive function reaches a peak only in, at about age 25. Right? So the main point uh, that I want to make here uh, is that um, executive function skills and the brain regions underlying executive function skills uh, take time to develop. And uh, children need the guidance uh, and practice to develop executive function skills. Right? Okay, so now I hope everyone has a good understanding of what executive functions are. Uh, let's look at the association between uh, executive functions and literacy. Right? So um, there's a lot of findings looking at the association between executive functions and literacy. And there's actually strong evidence showing that children who are better with their executive function skills, they actually perform better on literacy skills as well, right? And uh, because I'm the first speaker in the panel, let me just give a broad uh, definition of what, what we mean by literacy. So literacy refers to the ability to, uh, to speak, to write, to listen, uh, in a manner that allows you to communicate effectively and uh, make sense, uh, make sense of the world. I think uh, my panel speakers would uh, would agree, would elaborate further on that, right? Uh, and in early childhood, when we say literacy, uh, the way we assess it is how children are able to identify, um, read, and write uh, letters, alphabets, uh, and words, right? And um, a lot of uh, research findings has actually looked at these associations. You can look, you can look to see that there are actually a lot of studies that have looked at this association. And let's have a closer look at uh, what some of these uh, findings or studies uh, report, right? Um, this graph here uh, actually shows the findings from a research center in the US. Right? And it looks at three to five year olds children's performance on executive function tasks and their literacy skills or how well they can identify letters, right? So the bottom scale here that you see uh, actually measures the executive function skills and the vertical um, you know, scale here shows their literacy skills. And what you can see is as the executive function abilities increase, right, as it goes that way, you can find that their literacy skills also increase, right? So children with better executive function skills are performing better in their ability to identify or read words, right? And similar findings were reported with a Singaporean sample of four to five-year-olds, right? Recent study. And again, this is looking at children's executive function scales, the bottom scale, and the, and the vertical scale is looking at how well they can spell words, right? And uh, the different lines is actually looking at different sub-samples, but they all have the same pattern. You can see that as executive functions improve, the spelling ability also increases. Right? So the evidence is clear, right? Executive functions are important for literacy skills. So um, we know that executive functions are important for literacy skills, but what is the connection, right? Why? So um, let's look at a few examples. Think about uh, reading, like a child learning to read words, right? So if they have to spell a word, uh, if they have to read a word, they have to keep in mind the sounds associated with each letter, right? They have to hold in mind the, the sounds associated with each, with each letter, with each alphabet, and then put it all together in order to pronounce the complete word. And this is where working memory helps, right? Um, and, you know, inhibition, sometimes some letters may look similar, right? Think about the letter B or P or D, right? They all look similar. So children have to inhibit the, the wrong or the incorrect letter sound um, that may be activated along with the correct letter sound, right? In order to pronounce the word correctly, right? And uh, cognitive flexibility is needed when children learn that some, some letters 
are silent in some words, right? For example, think about the word uh, E in cake, right? They don't actually pronounce the E. Or the S in an island. They don't actually pronounce the S in the word island. So children need um, the cognitive flexibility to, uh, you know, switch between how to pronounce the different letters in different words, right? Next, let's look at um, writing or, or more specifically, let's look at spelling, right? Think about a child, uh, you know, trying to spell the word ball, right? They have to keep in mind the word ball while they also try to think of the letters associated with the sound, right? For this, they need working memory. And again, inhibition is needed because some letters look similar. So they have to inhibit writing out the wrong letter um, instead of the, the correct letter, right? And uh, cognitive flexibility is needed because sometimes some letters have the same sound in different words, right? Think about taxi, right? The letter I has the E sound, taxi, right? But in the word happy, it's the letter Y that has the E sound, right? So both different letters, I and Y, but they both have the same E sound in different words. So cognitive flexibility helps the children to identify the correct uh, letter to use with the with that specific word. All right? Okay. So now that we know that executive functions are important for literacy skills, what are some things that um, caregivers, educators can do to foster these skills in, in children? Um, as I mentioned, children need to learn executive function skills. It's not something that, uh, you know, that they have automatically. So, and the best way that they learn is by observing, right? So caregivers can take advantage of these by showing them, um, you know, how to behave in situations that require executive function skills. Uh, and this helps to set uh, examples for children and also helps to scaffold their EF abilities, right? Um, educators can also do that by, you know, real-life situations or even role-playing different scenarios and telling children how to, um, how to act in certain uh, situations, right? Next, um, having regular routines for, you know, regular activities like sleeping, eating, or playing uh, can actually help children to remember and know what to expect, right? So, uh, for example, if they know that after dinner time, they have play time, or maybe they have to help out with some simple chores. It helps them to uh, prepare themselves and recall what they did the last time before. So it is actually training their memory um, and adapting their behavior for the right situation. Right? Um, children, parents can also get the children involved in different kinds of activities that require executive function skills. Uh, there are actually a lot of games that require executive function skills. And in my next slide, uh, I'm going to go through some of these specific activities. Uh, but broadly, these activities should be something that, uh, you know, challenges or requires executive function skills um, in a fun and enjoyable context, right? And related to these is enrichment activities. So these enrichment activities can be anything like drawing, coloring, uh, singing, or even uh, sports activities uh, that the children, uh, that the child enjoys, um, has fun with, but is also a way to practice their executive function skills, right? And uh, lastly, uh, we have to ensure that children's basic needs are being met. So basic needs meaning they should have enough nutritious food. Uh, this is important for their brain functioning and development. Um, they should also be getting enough sleep, right? Sleep is a time where the brain repairs itself and um, it's also a time when um, the connections between uh, what they learned when they were awake is being strengthened, right? So this is good for, important for memory formation. So sleep is a very basic need, but um, local data, you know, published a few years ago actually shows that Singaporean children are not getting enough sleep, right? So this is uh, definitely an area that we can improve on, right? And uh, children also need uh, enough care and attention. Uh, if they're not getting enough attention or if there's neglect, uh, it's actually a form of stress for children and um, uh, it causes them to not function well, right? So children need to know, children need interactive relationships and uh, they need to know that, uh, you know, that they're safe and there's someone that they can go to when they need help, right? So only when their basic needs are being met, can they focus on other things like waiting for their turn or remembering things, right? So the basic needs is very important and needs to be met, right? 
So let's move on to some specific activities that uh, caregivers can get the child involved in. Uh, first, we look at uh, activities that are meant for three to five year olds. Uh, first one, role playing or imaginary play. So this is an activity get, that um, you know, allows children to think of alternate ways of behaving. Right? So when they switch to a character, it requires cognitive flexibility. Right? And inhibition and working memory are needed because they need to remember which role they are playing and also inhibit acting out of character or acting as themselves, right? Uh, freeze game is also another, uh, you know, fun way to train their memory and inhibition. So you get children moving about to, you know, music, and then you get them to remember that different music requires them to move in a fast or a slow pace. And then when the music stops, they have to stop and inhibit all movements, right? A quiet game is when you tell the child that they have to remain silent for a period of time. The rule is to remain silent, right? And this trains their memory and inhibition skills. Uh, it is actually a great way to get some quiet time if you need time to think or if you are driving or in a bus, right? Getting this, um, getting this game is actually a very effective way. Um, if you can't see, this is actually taking turns. Right? So when you're playing with toys, you can actually bring in the concept of waiting for your turn. Right, so children have to inhibit and wait patiently for their turn. Uh, storytelling is actually a great way to build on their language and vocabulary, but it's also a good way to train their uh, attention skills. So the ability to focus their attention, sustain their attention as they, um, you know, they wait and listen to the story unfold. Uh, games, games with gestures. Right, uh, trains their memory as they have to remember the sequence of actions uh, and focus. Um, and, uh, and remember those actions as they play the, 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 the gesture games. And uh, at this age, you can also get them involved in uh, simple physical activities. So this can be things like balancing or just uh, remembering a sequence of uh, actions like jumping jacks, right? So this will, um, uh, uh, you know, train their executive function skills as well in a fun way. For older children, children aged between five to seven years old, uh, the activities uh, needs to be a little bit more challenging so that they are interested and uh, engaged in it. Uh, but of course, it needs to match their skills and abilities, right? Um, you know, you can get them to play board games, which requires them to uh, focus their attention, remember rules, uh, wait for their turn, right? All of these are practicing executive function skills. Uh, you can also get them involved in movement games like musical chess. Right, this game requires them to pay close attention, focus, move quickly, and also inhibit quickly, right? So again, training executive functions. At this age, you can get them involved in more structured and organized uh, physical activities like team sports. So um, most team sports actually require children to pay close attention, focus, uh, inhibit doing the wrong thing. So it's all actually practicing the executive function skills in the, in the context of fun games. And uh, when they are a little bit older and they can uh, recognize and read letters or uh, numbers, um, you can get them involved in quiet games like puzzles, uh, word searches, or, or guessing games, right? So all of these activities that I mentioned, um, you know, the, the one commonality is that they all are done in a fun, enjoyable uh, context that the child finds interesting and enjoyable. Right? But at the same time, they also require the child to practice the executive function skills to a different extent. Right? So uh, caregivers should select activities that the, the child is interested in. And also, um, you know, have, let them have a say on how long they want to play those games. Right? And the other important thing is to, um, to make sure that the child... Um, uh, has rep repeated exposure to these ga games. So it's not just one instance, but they have frequent exposure to these activities and different kinds of activities uh, so that they have uh, opportunities to practice different executive function skills in different contexts, right? So with, uh, you know, gradually, we would see improvements in the executive function skills uh, with uh, repeated exposure, okay? So, um, some of these uh, activities are actually recommended by child development scientists from Harvard University. So, I have this website here if anyone is interested. Uh, the website actually has more details and more activities uh, suggested. Right? Okay, um, I want to end my session by highlighting two common misconceptions that um, you know, teachers, caregivers have about executive functions. 
The first one is that, um, you know, we expect executive functions to get better with age. So we think that children would uh, automatically improve in their executive function skills as they grow older. Now, while it's true that children's executive function skills improve with age, like we saw in the graph earlier, it doesn't happen automatically, right? Children need the guidance and practice. And uh, children who don't receive this guidance and practice, they continue to lag behind as they grow older. And research actually shows that children who have um, poor executive function skills, they, they grow up to be adults who have poor executive uh, function skills as well. So it's very important um, you know, to develop these skills and the best time is when they are young, right? We saw that between the ages of three to five is, is really the best time to start focusing on these skills, right? And um, the, the second um, uh, common misconception is that children who have poor executive function skills, they're not actually bad children or naughty children, right? Um, the likelihood is that they haven't probably had enough opportunities to um, practice these executive function skills or because of some biological factor, right? So a good strategy would be to give them a safe space uh, where they can actually have a lot of opportunities to practice executive function skills uh, in a gradual way uh, without overwhelming them, right? So this is um, uh, some uh, misconceptions and some recommendations that I have. And uh, I will just give a brief uh, summary of my, of my talk uh, before I end off. First, we know that uh, executive functions are important skills, uh, particularly we saw for literacy skills. And um, executive functions don't develop automatically, but require practice, uh, repeated practice, and the guidance of adults. And um, uh, interactive relationships, uh, positive enriching experiences are needed so children get to observe what executive function skills are, what good executive function skills are, and uh, also opportunities to uh, uh, practice these skills. And uh, I went through some activities uh, where you, know, you can actually get children to practice these skills in a, in a fun uh, and enjoyable context, right? So um, thank you very much for listening to, to my talk, and I hope it's uh, been beneficial in some way, right? So I'll pass over to uh, Mary now. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. Okay, I struggle with executive function skill daily. My battle is Netflix or sleep. <laughs> and of course, I choose Netflix because, yeah, but I know I need my sleep, right? Yeah, and I think the other one, I can relate to the part about diet. I just down, I think, eight pieces of chocolate cake earlier. I couldn't resist, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, but thank you so much, Dr. Aisha, because I think, yeah, the... You know, the information that you, you shared are very, they are engaging, I think, and probably very important to many of us here as we, as we are still learning about executive functions and how they impact literacy. I, I can definitely relate because I think for very young children, we probably have to start with the guidance and the support right now at this, at this stage. Thank you so much. So next, over to you, Dr. Mary. Yeah? Thanks. Okay, um, today I'm going to talk about bilingualism in early childhood. Yeah, so uh, maybe just let me go through uh, what we mean by bilingualism. Yeah, um, many of us in Singapore, in fact, we, are, we speak more than one language. Yeah, that's why we are called a bilingual. If you speak more than um, two languages, you can call yourself like three, uh, trilingual or multilingual. Yeah. So many of us, actually, we are able to speak uh, many languages because of uh, our parents, grandparents, and also we are in this community that we are well integrated you know, with each other. Yeah. So today, um, although this, today's the theme is on uh, exploring literacy, but I will be focusing more on the oral language. That means um, it's the words that we hear and also the words that we say. Yeah. I focus more on the oral language because... Uh, oral language, in fact, is the foundation for literacy. Yeah. So literacy later, I will leave it to the, our expert here. Yeah. User will talk more and give you tips on uh, literacy uh, development and skills. Yeah. Okay. So being bilingual, um, for for all of us who are bilingual, we see some benefits of that. So first of all, we it really helps us to communicate with our family and especially extended families. 
Yeah, so for, for your child, if your child can speak, for example, like Hokkien or Malay or Tamil, I'm sure that they can actually communicate with their grandparents much better. Yeah. So this is a communication skill that we are talking about. Yeah, having um, able to speak and understand another language. Yeah. And also being able to understand and speak another language, it helps our children to connect with and continue our cultural uh, heritage. So we know that what our, you know, being ethnic Chinese and being able to speak Mandarin and Hokkien, it really helped me to understand um, my roots. Yeah, I'm sure that that will uh, be the same for, uh, for our Malay families or Tamil families as well here. Because, for example, when we talk about uh, Hari Raya recently, so when I learned all this Malay Koi name, you know, from, from my um, colleagues, I have to really learn it in Malay. And I remember in Malay, and then I know the history uh, of all these um, practices in Malay as well. Yeah. So thankfully, I learned Malay, so I'm able to appreciate it much better. So uh, the third benefit that I leave, uh, list here is to stimulate uh, mental development and executive functions. Just now we hear from Dr. Aisha talk so much about executive functions. So uh, when our child, they listen to two languages, can you imagine that they really have to figure out uh, what does that mean? Yeah, when you say uh, bola versus um, ball versus chill, then they will really have to figure out what are you talking about? So this, in fact, uh, this daily um, experience of listening to different languages and also to select what language to speak to. When they are in the Malay uh, class, they know that Malay teacher only want to listen to the Malay. So they will have to choose the right Malay words. Yeah. So when they uh, speak to their grandparents, they will know that grandparents, my grandparents can only understand Mandarin. So I have to speak uh, Mandarin to the, um, to the grandparents. So you can see that, in fact, this is already a very good practice for the executive functions. Yeah. So um, the last part that I want to talk about the benefit of bilinguals uh, it is to improve ability to socialize. So the research actually show that uh, bilingual children, in fact, they have less bias about others. So imagine when we are able to speak different languages, we can understand others better. Yeah. So they can communicate also better with their friends in school, uh, even though their friends may not be able to speak English or may not be, be able to speak the same language as they do. Okay. So that will help them to socialize better. So I'm going to uh, address three common questions that parents have about um, raising a bilingual child. So the first question is, should I adopt the one parent, one language approach with my child? Yeah. So this happened when uh, both parents, in fact, can speak both languages uh, pretty well. Yeah. But parents are thinking that should maybe, uh, should my husband uh, use ma English with my child and then I use Mandarin with my child? Is that a better option? Okay. So, so the research show that one parent, one language can actually lead to successful accusation. Yeah. So if you are currently practicing this and you think that this is the best way to go, yes, you can go ahead with that. Yeah. But what I want to uh, highlight here is it is really not necessary for you to restrict to this just one approach. If both you and your spouse are able to speak two languages well, in fact, it will be good for your child to listen to two languages from both of you because you will realize that the vocabulary, the way you talk, the way you use the language will be very different from your spouse. Okay? So the better it is if your child is exposed to different communicative partners and speak in two languages. And you know children, they are very smart. They will learn that if Papa always speak to me in Malay, Mama always speak to me in English, they will know that, okay, when I want to speak, in a particular language or if a particular parent, they will choose to speak only that language. Yeah. In fact, expand their repertoire of speaking to many people as much as possible. In fact, that will be the ideal situation. So you don't really have to restrict yourself to one language, one parent, one language. And also imagine that if you say that, okay, Papa will speak Malay and then I will speak English. But because... Uh, Papa, you know, work really very long hours. By the time when Papa come home, that, that your child doesn't really have much opportunity to practice a Malay. Okay? Yeah. So that is the situation. If both of you are able to and confident about using both languages, go ahead and then speak the both languages to your child. Okay? Some parents, they want to practice this one parent, one language approach. It's because they are worried. We are worried that our child may get confused with two languages. Yeah. So what if I speak 
this sentence in English and later I switch it to Mandarin, will my child get confused? In fact, the evidence shows that bilingual children from very young, in fact, they are not confused. Yeah? So just that because when they are young, when they are learning, they tend to mix two languages together. That doesn't mean that in their brain, actually, get, they get all messed up. Yeah? Later, I will talk more about this. So not to worry that they are not going to get confused. Although when they are learning two languages, sometimes they seem to get confused. Okay? Because there's a lot of things happen in their brain. Like what we just now, we also learned from Dr. Aisha about executive functions, right? When they, were, they are really young, there are a lot of things happen. And for them to convert their ideas into words is not that easy. So they really have to manage control of one language and speak to another language. That's why sometimes they, they seem to mess up and then we think that they get confused by these two languages. Okay? So as I mentioned, it really helps if your child is able to hear and then also use a language to communicate with our different partners. So the next question that I mentioned just now is about mixing. Yeah. So if your child speaks one language, in English, but a particular word your child doesn't understand, doesn't know, can't really recall the word, then the, your child put in a Malay word inside or put in a Mandarin word inside. It's quite common, right? Yeah. So it's quite common, especially when they are better in one language. For example, they are better in Mandarin. They speak a lot of Mandarin at home. And then when they start to go to school, they learn English. So then they can get confused. They seem to get confused by having one sentence in Mandarin but then because they do not know, for example, in school, teacher talk about a raising flag. So they do not know that flag actually means Guo Qi or Qi in Mandarin or Bandera in Malay because um, at home, we do not talk so much about flag because this is a word in English that they learn from school. So when they talk to you and when they want to tell you what happened in school, they may say that, ah, 今天我们在学校唱国歌, 然后我们有那个flag. Right? Yeah, so that is, that is quite common uh, for bilingual children when they start to learn two languages. So this is actually a very common development for young children and it serves the function of communication when your child are learning two languages. But if we correct the child in this way and we say that it's not flag, this is called guo qi, you know why you always say flag? Yeah. Can you imagine that how frustrated your child will become because they are trying to communicate their idea with you. So at this point of time, as parents and educators, we actually encourage them. What we can do is you do not negatively correct them. What you can do is you model the way to say. You say, oh, today you're in school, uh, uh, and you You can also say this one in the complete sentences in English to demonstrate to your child. Okay. So model the good languages to your child is the best way to go. Okay. Oh, oh, not very good, is it? Okay, is that better? Okay. So the third question that I want to uh, address is about uh, what happened just now because I mentioned a few times that if both you and your spouse are proficient in both languages. But what if... Uh, your spouse can only speak English, but not Mandarin or Malay, for example. So you wonder whether is that, um, is that, that my child become at this disadvantage because there's no exposure to two languages. In fact, the research show that even for parents who are only proficient in one language, we are still able to raise a proficient bilingual children. Okay, so why is that so? Because, more importantly, it's not just because you are the only communication partner with your child. You can actually explore many other opportunities for your children to be exposed to two languages. Yeah. Of course, ideally, if you are able to speak two languages, that would be, that would be a great situation. But if you do not, not to worry. Yeah? There are many other ways that you can do. So, what you can do is, if you are not so comfortable to speak in Hokkien, or Cantonese, what you can do is you tap your grandparents, grandparents, relatives, or maybe you find playmates who can speak the language that you are not so familiar with. But there are also other opportunities that you can explore, right? Because for example, if they go to, if they go to school, they'll also learn another language in school. They get to communicate with their friends in that language that you are not, are not good at. 
But what is the key here? The key here is our attitude and our motivation. Yeah. So we learn together with your child. Yeah. When my, when my child starts to learn our French, actually I pick up some French as well. Yeah. Because I'm interested to see what she is learning and therefore I also learn together with her. Yeah. In fact, I have seen many parents who learn along with their children, especially if they are foreigners, but because their child has only the option of um, Mandarin or Malay in school, but there is no Tagalog offer in school. But the parents actually, they pick up a lot of uh, Mandarin or Malay. It depends on uh, what classes that your, uh, the child goes to. Yeah, so it's really important. It's about our attitude. Yeah. Beside our attitude and motivation, what is quite common in Singapore is we see another language as an academic subject or a very economical subject. For example, with the rising of China economy, then we suggest that it's best that you take Mandarin, right? Then next time, you have more opportunity. Or because of uh, the primary school examination, then it's best that you learn this language as, um, as good, you know, from very young. We forget that what is really important, it is about our attitude and, and how we perceive that language. Yeah. So the research shows that if parents we see the language beyond academic subject, beyond academic achievement, that is where we can motivate our child to speak and to be able to learn and use the language well. Okay? So to end my um, talk today, I just want to share some tips. In fact, it's just one big tip, okay? So this big tip is find whatever that is that work for your family and what is sustainable for your family? If nobody at your home can speak Mandarin, then do not give up. What will be sustainable? Maybe find the playmate is not really work, doesn't really work well. So what can do maybe is to um, find a very interactive program uh, for your child to attend to. When I say interactive program, it is really not going to school and learn about the Chinese stroke and how to write Chinese words. Yeah, maybe it is to learn about Chinese song, watch Chinese cartoon together. That will be more motivating and interesting for your child. Okay, many um, teenagers that I, I know that they talk about, uh, they learn Chinese from the Chinese voice program. You know, the Tung Guo Hao Senying, that program. Because of that, they learn a lot of uh, new Chinese songs and they find that those songs are really good and they are curious about the lyrics. And with the China drama that is really coming out and more interesting, in fact, many of my friends and some um, young people, they told me that because of the drama, then they'll go and read the books. Yeah? And if they have the foundation from the very young that they are exposed to um, a second language, it is a, they are able to pick up the language much faster. Okay? Yeah. So what really works and sustainable for your family, that should be the way to go. Okay? Yeah. Uh, but the underlying the key is really about providing the high quantity and also the high quality. So the high quantity here is about the hours of exposure. So if your child go to a, a childcare center, like for example, like PCF, and then you, are, you, you will know that your child have good exposure of English in school. And then they will have like half an hour or one hour of Mandarin or Malay or Tamil classes, right? Yeah. So then at home, if you are able to speak um, Mandarin, Malay or Tamil better, maybe that is a language that where you want to speak more at home because you really know that your child spent maybe a good uh, eight hours in um, a childcare center with a good exposure of English. Yeah. So try to maximize the number of hours that your child can be exposed to uh, both languages. Okay. Beside uh, quantity, then the next thing is about, of course, is about quality. Yeah, so uh, giving your child a tablet for your child to watch the Chinese cartoon or the Malay cartoon, that is a very passive way of learning the language because your child is just listening to the language but it's not interactive. In fact, your child learned the language by saying it and then find out that, oh, that is not the way I say it. I should say it the other way. I should try to modify my words so that another person can understand me. Yeah that serve the communication function that is actually more motivating rather than just passively watching the tablet or watching the TV. Yeah? 
So there are many activities that you can do with your child just now that uh, uh, Dr. Aisha mentioned. You know, playing with the games, that can be the words game. Yeah, connecting words. Um, doing the pretend play. Yeah, the pretend play, maybe the doctor and the patient. Today, I'm a patient that can only speak Malay, so doctor must speak Malay to me. Yeah, so that is how you can actually combine many activities that achieve the, the different kind of goals. Okay, uh, our library in Singapore, in fact, there are many um, good programs that they, they run, you know, they read to the children. And there are also some audio books. If you find that, okay, I'm not very good in Mandarin, can I, you can download some audio books, but don't just give the audio book to the child. Read together with the child and learn together with your child. So that is where um, we can actually improve the high uh, quality of um, you know, using the language with your child. And maybe visit the grandparents more regularly. They are your good resource. Okay? Mm, uh, I think the last point I, I have to really highlight, really go beyond um, seeing this language as an, academic, as an academic subject. When your child feels like culturally, it's really more connected, and then I also have my own interest because of, because of the movie, the drama, the songs, the music. If when they feel more connected and that actually related to their individual interest, your child will be more keen to learn that language and learn that language well. Yeah. So I will end my talk here and then later we can chat a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary. I think... It's um, very real and your encouragement will probably be very useful for most parents here because I, I suppose we are dominantly English speaking right now. So your ideas on how we can include and those tips that, you know, how we can include a second language in our conversation with children will probably you know, be beneficial to many parents here. Okay, so lastly, Miss Yosa, over to you for your sharing. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about my topic, Building Literacy at Home. So I will be covering the importance of literacy and also teaching parents strategies on how you can utilize materials available at home to build on your child's literacy skill. So literacy is something that um, will affect children from young to their old and it will snowball when they are older because it will not only affect their reading and writing skills but also their social emotional development. So as children grow, so they also have a developed self-awareness and knowing that they are unable to read and write like how their peers are doing in class, they might feel uh, they might feel inferior or they might have uh, low self-esteem and that will discourage them from doing uh, literacy work and that will even lead to task avoidance in class or at home. So children will benefit more in the later years if uh, the literacy issues are addressed at a younger age. So why my topic building literacy at home? So um, because literacy begins at home, right? So home is the first learning environment for children where they grow and develop since they are born. And parents being the main caregiver, you provide opportunity for them and also act as role model influencing their learning interests. So parents are the first teacher because parents spend most of the time with children uh, before they go to school. And according to research, most effective uh, period for connective skills investment for parents is uh, the early years of children's life. So earlier on, Dr. Aisha has also shared how early executive functioning skills can help children to acquire literacy skills. So also, other studies have also found out uh, positive associations uh, like parents reading to the child and uh, have developed their cognitive uh, cognitive skills. So children who are read to, they usually develop more vocabularies and have more advanced um, comprehension skills. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say here is like parental involvement is very, very important and it can make significant difference in children's academic success. So here I have two uh, writing samples. So I would like you all to focus on the right uh, writing samples. So 
Previously, I have supported this child. She has difficulty remembering how to form letters and she doesn't like writing at all. But with parental involvement, parents have been practicing with her regularly and now she's able to write sentence by herself and she also knows that whenever she writes a sentence, she needs to have a finger spacing between words and even leaving a full stop at the end of a sentence. So parents' involvement is really very, very important so you already can make a difference in your child's life. And you know what's most amazing thing is? Building literacy at home is as easy as ABC. So earlier on, I shared about how research had uh, showed that story reading uh, really helps your child to develop literacy skills. So there are different stages in achieving literacy, such as letter name, letter sounds, word recognition, and sentence writing. So I will be sharing with you how the stages can help you all to, uh, you, by using materials which you can find at home, right, to build on the different stages in literacy. Some of the easy uh, materials which you can find at home are like, maybe you, if you have expired flour, powder, or even paints, like paper plates or cups, like, you know, you go attend like children's party and they have a lot of leftover plates or cups. So you can keep it and use it to, to set it as, uh, to help you to create like fun activity for your child. Or even you can use like Legos, blocks, or even ingredients like salt. So you can just put the salt on a tray and getting your child to practice tracing um, using their fingers. And, and like, for example, you want the child to trace like uh, letters or even like words on the salt itself. And also you can use uh, flyers, cupboards, or even like newspaper or magazine. So let's say if you want your child to find or be able to identify certain letters, you can get your child to circle by finding the letters in the magazine or newspaper or even cut out the letters or the words that you want your child to be able to read. So over the next few slides, I'll be sharing with you how you can utilize the material which you can find at home to, to build on your child's literacy skills. So over here is to build uh, letter names and letter sounds. So on your left, the picture here, uh, what I did is I would put uh, paper cups on the floor and get the child to kick towards the paper cups. So when the child kicks towards the letters, the child has to say the letter. The, the, uh, the child have to say the letters and then when the child is um, on your right, when the child is holding on to the ball, right? So you, maybe you can say, uh, I want you to throw towards the letter G. So the child will throw towards and say the letter G. So you can use these two activities to build on your child's uh, letter sound knowledge as well. Moving on to build on word recognition. So on the left here, this is one of the activity I always bring around with me whenever I have intervention sessions because the children love this activity. It's just a very simple one. It's just, um, I will just put the paper plates on the floor. So what the children need to do is to um, hop as they find the paper plates. So when they pick up one paper plate, they have to read the words. Yeah, so it's just very simple and easy to play with, but they really enjoy it and they often always ask me to bring along each time they have session. So on your right, uh, it's more of using paper cups. So let's say if you want to teach your child um, on how to read certain words, so you can look into the details of words. Like for example, if you want your child to be able to uh, learn the word run, R-U-N, right? So you can get your child to find the first letter, which is R the next letter which is U, and the last letter which is N. So the child has to look into the details and then put accordingly to make the word run. So this also applies uh, to Legos as well. So uh, it applies similarly. So I would like to focus more on the picture on your right, which is uh, powder. I have placed powder in a plastic container. So this is a very fun activity for children as well because children love sensory play, right? So what I did is when I was teaching a child how to identify words, I get the child to practice tracing it on the powder. So they can feel the texture and it's soft. They totally enjoy it so much that they always want to practice it again and again. 
Moving on, so if your child has uh, emerging uh, literacy skill already, so if you want to continue to teach your child like what's family, so what you can do is again you using like paper cups to get your child to form uh, words and get your child to read, or even like uh, putting like paper plates on the floor and getting your child to hop around and try to um, to sound out the word together to read the words. Lastly, if you want to teach your child to build on sentence writing, so this is an easy way which you can use by writing on a paper. So you form the sentence and then you cut it out and then get the child to look at it. So the child can read it and also learn about the sentence structure and also know about, you know, uh, when you write a sentence, you must always start with an uppercase letter, have finger spacing between the words and full stop. So with all those activities, right, it's very simple and it can be done very easily because you don't even need a printer. So you can just write on the uh, material itself. Okay, so as you introduce the activity to your children, always teach them first because they won't know how to use it. So always, we adults, we must teach them how to play the activity, how to do it, and we can model to them, show them how to do it, and then you get them to practice. So of course, when you practice, you don't only practice one time, so you have to be continuously uh, practicing with them because consistency is the key. Okay, and learning is a continuous process. So that's when like, they will learn um, as they get to practice. So parents, you can co uh, continue to, you know, always provide opportunity with uh, all this fun and engaging activity to help them to go through with their literacy skills to teach them. And the faster you tackle on the literacy issues, right, it will be better for your children when they grow older. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Yusuf, for being, you know, for the delightful sharing. I love the concrete examples. I think as parents, many of us would, you know, feel encouraged that we can try this at home because it's using paper plates and things that we can find at home. All right, so before we go on to Q&A, let's take a group picture, yeah? So can I invite you to the front? Okay, now I'm going to open up um, the floor uh, for your questions, parents or um, educators, adults, anyone you have. Yeah, great. Thank you, sir. Yes, please come up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hi. It's been a, a really insightful uh, uh, session. Uh, thank you for the presentation just now. I, um, I have a, my questions. Okay, let me make it simple. My I have a one-year-old nephew, one-year-old plus, and um, so I'm wondering, so my question is, um, is it possible for a child to acquire a third language uh, given the circumstances in a modern family? So my, my brother, his wife is Vietnamese, right? Then I speak with my mom, I, I speak to my mom in Cantonese. So my, my brother's family visits us like one or twice a month. Uh, when we interact, it's like mainly Mandarin, right? But if I ask my mom to kind of um, force herself to talk to my nephew in Cantonese, that's a bit hard, given the context. Uh, but the child could listen to me and my mom talk in Cantonese. So how much can the child absorb? So I'm wondering, I, maybe we, it's like we, we probably have to give up hope of the child learning a third language which could be Vietnamese or Cantonese uh, because of my uh, sister-in-law's uh, family. So, um, like, I understand the benefits, right? So I really want the child to acquire a third language uh, or fourth language. So just wondering whether is it possible for a modern family? Yeah. So Dr. Mary, I think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take this question. Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, the research show that... Uh, and infant babies, if they're exposed to different languages, in fact, that will help them, um, that will help them to pick up the language much, much better later. 
Yeah. So, of course, if they have the exposure that they have at this point of time, it is really quite limited. Then it is difficult to expect a certain proficiency later. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So, which means that if your child, if that, if that child only exposed to, uh, let's say, Hainanese, uh, maybe once um, an hour a month, yeah, it is difficult for the child to be able to be proficient in Hainanese. But later on, if the child wants to pick up Hainanese and when the exposure become, become high and when the child is motivated to use, this child will be able to pick up Hainanese much better and much faster compared to a child who has no exposure to Hainanese at all before. Yeah, so, so I guess then the question is really about what is our expectation in terms of the proficiency level. Yeah. So if our, our children only exposed to, uh, to Mandarin or Malay in school and then they are not really motivated to learn and then their proficiency level is still low, but that they will still become more advantaged if we compare to other children who have no exposure to a Mandarin, Malay or Tamil from young. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 I, I guess the key here, if there is opportunity to expose the child to other languages, expose them as young as possible. Yeah, uh, but we should also manage our expectation about the proficiency if the exposure in terms of the quantity and the quality is uh, quite minimum, then we shouldn't be expecting too high. Yeah, but if the child is motivated later on to pick up that language and also have the opportunity, we will be able to expect a, a, a better outcome. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. But this is a very real issue about uh, losing, uh, knowing our cultural heritage and the root because we lose um, the understanding of the language. Yeah. That is a real issue in the modern society. So uh, we encourage parents try to uh, motivate your child and use the language as uh, much as possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. So I think what I hear is the early exposure, the early experience is, is essential enough for the child to have that interest in later part of the years. So all is not lost actually. So there is still, there is still some opportunity there that the child may want to pick up and grow in this language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so if any one of us here, if uh, you did not really get to expose to another language and you want to learn the language now, in, it's never too late. Yeah. Um, but if you compare to the adult learner for, for the second language, you will find that we are able to pick up the grammar and the vocabulary uh, quite quickly. But in terms of the speech sound, you can actually, you can also pick up a lot from me because English, in fact, is my third or fourth language. Yeah. So in terms of the speech sound, um, I may not be very accurate, you know, even after many years of exposure. But I'm still able to deliver a, a talk in English and then I, I guess most of you probably will still be able to understand me. So I would think that it will, it will never be too late to learn another language. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Thank you. Um, any parents? Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Please. I'm not. Huh? Uh, thank you for. I, I really uh, absorbed quite a lot from the panel. Uh, my my question. I'm not really sure whether it is really very relevant in this situation. Uh, is that uh, sometimes kids uh, there are certain alphabets they cannot pronounce very well. You know, like the letter uh, L. You know, like the letter R. So how or is there any recommendation how to improve, you know, like, like, like this boy, he cannot pronounce the word L properly. So whenever he says below, he will say pido. Yeah, so I was wondering, you know, how as a grandparent, how to act. <laughs> to correct that. <laughs> Thank you. So nice. Yeah, so it really takes a whole village to raise a child. Yeah. You, sir, would you like to answer this? Because I think, yeah, it's very much related to the topic that you covered. Yes. Okay. So, uh, because in, in your question is you are, talk, you are referring to the child's speech, right? The speech development. So, children, as they grow, especially at their, his age, uh, they are still developing the speech. Yeah. So, maybe... 
uh, for him, he, he haven't uh, grabbed the skills of being able to say the sound L, for the L sounds. So how you can do, uh, what you can do also is you model to him. You don't need to say, no, you're wrong. But you can say, oh, you mean you're talking about the pillow. So you can stress on the words. Yeah, to show him how is it pronounced. Yeah, so as he hear, he will be able to absorb and he, slowly he will be able to know how to pronounce the words also. Yeah. I got another grandson that is already 11 years old and he still cannot pronounce the L word letter. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe I will just uh, add on. Um, you know, it's the same with uh, language development. It's the same with our gross motto, meaning that our make muscle and then small motto as in our fine motto. Uh, how we hold pencil, how the children use scissors and all that. And then speech also, they will go through a development stages. Yeah, so there will be certain sound that they will pick up very easily. So the sound that we know that uh, young children pick up very quickly will be like, like mama, bab, you know, papa. That's why, you know, mama, papa is quite universal in um, many languages. But there are certain sounds that the children will learn and pick up much later. And there are developmental stages. You know, it's like we don't expect children to be able to run at one year old, right? One year old, they are only able to walk and they're able to uh, slowly then, um, then they are able to run later. Yeah, so... Mm, so like what user has mentioned is you model the right way to your child or to your grand grandchild. Uh, but if after you try a few times, you realize that your child, that child is still not able to pick up, I would suggest that it is possible that there are some difficulty that the child is experiencing. It is possible. Yeah. The best way to do is if your child is attending a childcare center, actually check in with the teacher. The teacher will know that what is considered the normal development or when it actually becomes a concern. Yeah. If your child go back to do, let's say, a, a vaccination in the clinic, in the polyclinic, or if your child is seeing a pediatrician, yeah, you can also check in with them. Yeah. So if there is really a concern about the um, speech development, because at a certain time, your child is still not able to pick up like the L sound or F sound or S sound, yeah. Um, your child, that child may need to go and see a speech therapist for a more thorough assessment. Yeah. So I'm not trying to, uh, you know, alert, uh, alarm, you know, that you go home and then you start to check all the sound. But if there is a concern, uh, believe your instinct, but then uh, check with the right uh, source of person to see whether, whether you will need your, ch the, your child will need a, a further assessment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Dr. Aisha, any, any inputs from you? <laughs> okay. All right. So before we end, any questions? Oh, we, we do have one. Hi. Thanks for the talks, everyone. Very insightful. Um, I've got two things. First one is for you, sir. Um, how early can we start this? So my kid's not yet two. So I think it's, a, I'm not sure if it's a bit too early, for example, to start these like letter recognition games and so on. So that's the first one. Second one is Dr. Aisha, could you share that website a second time? We couldn't catch it because it was blocked. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So Yusa, maybe you can answer the question first and we will share the slides. Yeah, soon. Okay, so your question is uh, how early should you introduce like literacy to your child, right? So uh, of course, like as a as a baby, we definitely will recommend you know um, like uh, playing numeracy rhymes with your child, get giving the exposure to your child. Definitely is not because your child is not uh, is not yet even for haven't attend school yet, so you won't be wa wanting your child to you know sit with you and, and you uh, being able to uh, even uh, talk about uh, let letter recognition. So what you can do is uh, giving the exposure, provide a lot of opportunity to your child to expose to them like through nursery rhymes, songs, or even like uh, storybooks, like how we uh, all, I'm sure all professional all agree that storybook is a great way to promote like not only um, reading and writing, but also talking about the picture. And you can uh, like, uh, teach your child through storybooks that oh you know this is number one so that that's when you create a lot of uh, this kind of opportunity for your child so that's the 
they, they are very clever. So they will absorb what you are telling them and uh, giving them the input. So they'll definitely absorb it. And as they grow older, they will be able to identify and learn uh, easier when, they, when it comes to like uh, alphabets or even numbers. Yeah. Um, so for the very young children, I usually encourage parents to use picture books without uh, too many words or even without words. Yeah. So we Singaporean parents, what we like to do is to read words by words and we also make our children read the words. Yeah. When they are only two, three years old, actually they are not expected in terms of development. They are not expected to read words. But when they can't read the words, then we get frustrated with ourselves and also with them. Yeah. So, so like what you should say, that you can do a lot of activities to really encourage like nursery rhymes. But if you want to read uh, uh, books, you know, the focus is really about um, talking to your child, communicate with your child and encourage your child also to talk yeah, and enjoy the story. And that's where your child actually will learn a lot of words and learn different sounds. And when they learn different sounds, they will be able to manipulate the sound. And then when they learn the words, for example, they learn big, beat, beam, then they will see the differences if they have a lot of exposure of all this. And then later when they learn the alphabets, they learn A actually look like this, B look like this, this is an A sound, this is a B sound. Then the oral language they have actually accumulated from the very beginning will actually will translate into their reading abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Okay, yeah, sure, please. So just a quick question to clarify. Um, just some of the research <clears throat> mentioned that there's a link between literacy and executive functions. So is it because um, the, um, when, you, when the child needs to perform more executive functions, there's more interaction to support the, that needs to uh, support the child's uh, performing the, the function? I mean, like, is it because of the interactions? Did, did they mention any... Any so, so I, I think you're asking about what, what, how is executive functions related to literacy? Or how does executive function help literacy? So, is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. yeah? I, I, I'm guessing that it's because there's more interaction. Well, yes, maybe because there's more interactions, but also because uh, executive function skills, you know, helps children to sit still, uh, listen without getting distracted, right, during literacy activities. So, when they can do all of these things, Right? During an uh, English class or any other kind of class, they can learn better. So that's going to help with the literacy. Right? And sitting still, not getting distracted, these are all uh, executive function skills. Right? So that's one way uh, you know, in which executive function skills help with um, literacy. Right? Uh, and I also went through how you know, when you're learning to spell uh, a word or when you're learning to read a word, right? sometimes you need to inhibit uh, you know, words that look similar sounds that sound similar, right? So inhibition is needed. And you also need to keep in mind, right? When you're spelling a word, um, you know, you need to keep in mind what that word is. So that's working memory. So um, writing, reading, all of them require executive function as well. So executive function help when you're learning, right? By helping you to sit still and listen and remember information. But it also helps you with the reading and writing as well, and more specifically. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so literacy can, uh, can refer to reading, writing, listening, identifying words and letters, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for all the questions. And I think most importantly, thank you for your sharing, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Mary and you, sir. Yeah, and we have come to the end of our almost evening presentation. Yes, and I want to thank all of you for being here and thank our speakers for all their sharing. So, dear parents and all present here, thank you so much. Have a great evening. So, see you tomorrow if you're joining us at One Pongo for another, for our day two of parenting conference. Right? Thank you. Good night. Good night.